Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mortgage Heroes Weekly Podcast. I'm Andy. I'm Brian. So today, Brian, we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. We've been covering the NAR lawsuit specifically because of VA for the last several weeks. Yep, yep. And uh, today we have a little bit of a mix up. Um, right at the top, we're going to talk about inflation because <laughs> uh, last week the inflation reading came out uh, still higher than expected. Uh, we're going to talk about why that's bad news for home buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to talk about should you refinance your mortgage? And then we're going to cover $1 million homes are now typical in a record number of U.S. cities. That article is insane. So true. Every house I walked this week was plus a $1 million. Yes. And these are like normal <laughs> suburban homes like just a couple years ago. Uh, and yeah. then we're going to lastly, we're going to close this up with U.S. home investors share reached all time high at the end of quarter four. So it seems late in the data, but I'll explain that when we get there. There's so, a lot of interesting stuff on that uh, article that I did. Oh, yes. Know. I was like, oh, wow, okay. Yes. So today's show is jam-packed with a lot of v variety, but uh, th <laughs> the information behind all this is honestly like shocking me a little bit. Yikes. Okay, so number one, inflation keeps rising, and why that's bad news for homebuyers this year. This is from Realtor.com. I intentionally pulled this from Realtor.com versus like, you know, Forbes or CNBC or whatever, because I wanted to get like, you know, the real estate Industry take specific. on inflation. Yeah. Everyone was talking about inflation last week. Obviously, CPI came in higher month over month. CPI came in higher year over year. Um, and I would like to remind everybody that the March year over year CPI at three and a half uh, is cumulative. So before we get into the details of this article, Remember, rolling inflation records are cumulative. So if it was 9.1% two years ago, and it was 6% last year, and it's now, let's say, 3.5%, that's cumulative. Um, only if it is zero or going with a negative before the number is it actually going in reverse. This is right. like me adding weight. So if I weighed 100 pounds two years ago and I added 9%, I'm 109. And then if I added 6% on top of that, then let's just easy math. Let's just say I was 115. And then I add 3% on top of that. Essentially what you're saying is you're just gaining weight regardless Correct. how small or big the gain and, is. <laughs> and this is why I'm telling it right here at the top. This is important because in articles like this, there is a unintentional mistake maybe being made in that we say inflation is going down versus inflation is slowing. So I want yeah. to make sure that's very clear. If there's a plus in front of the number, that means it's still growing. It's that does not slow. mean it is going down. That means it is slowing in its growth, not that it has retracted or contracted, I should say. Okay. Did you, did you want to talk about something about your weight after? Yeah, we're gonna have to talk about that too because I need uh, I need deflation in my uh, pounds. I heard a little <laughs> cry for help there. I'm like, I, <laughs> hey, hey, when you talk about the cumulative inflation, I noticed you were breathing really heavy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, inflation jumped in March, given the U.S. Federal Reserve ammunition to hold off on eagerly awaited interest rate cuts. For the fourth month running, inflation ticked up, reaching 3.5% year over year in March, and this was the biggest cumul biggest cumulative. Uh, increase since August of so last year. So waking up that morning last week, I was like, "What?" Yeah, and, and and I remember sending you guys that uh, that screenshot, and it wasn't that bad. It was like sixty three. I was like, "Dude, this is the bad, the worst it's been in the last couple of weeks." You know, I got to the office eighty. I was like, "Holy!" Well, wait, you have to explain oh, what you're talking 80 about. Eighty basis points, basically, yes. like you know, rates. So just so you have an idea, a hundred basis points will translate roughly maybe a quarter percent in increase of rates. So we to half, the, yeah, yeah, half, half more or less, yeah. yeah. So in the last, you know, two day, last three days of last week, we basically, you know, hit over a hundred basis points, and you know, the rates definitely right away it adjusted, and we saw them spike back up to seven and a quarter. You know, yeah. more or less that range this past yeah. week. So oh. in inflation is bad for the housing market for a number of reasons. Number one, when inflation is running hotter than what the Fed is expecting, and it's running hotter for longer than what they have said they are anticipating, they've stopped using words like transitory. They've stopped using words like soft landing. Um, and now you have more pundits and people and analysts and heads of banks saying, hey, it's sticky. It's here to stay. Yeah. Uh, it's becoming embedded. And I use those words too, not just because they've said them, but this is what happens. When people show a ability to continue paying the increased price, then that means you do not need to retreat on the price. Now on the sales side of things, on the retail side, if your customers are if your if your wholesale prices are still high and you 
add your margin to that to sell to the customer at the retail side. Well, if my wholesale cost is still high, I'm passing that on to the customer. That's how it works everywhere, whether it's the drive through or at the Walmart or the gas station or whatever it is you're buying. Fast food uh, so, supply chains. So you have to go upstream. And so the, 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 the problem here is that it really comes down to the bond market where in the mortgage-backed security market where mortgage money comes from. If it is more, if, if it looks like inflation is going to run rampant and run higher for longer, then the market has to keep its margins in place in order to continue offering money for, to be lent out to people, mm-hmm. which only means mortgage rates stay high or go higher, and they will find a new local level in the future. Yeah, and th- that's a tricky part that we keep, you know, going up and down in this, uh, in these uh, rate environment that you know a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, one day they're approved, other day they're not approved, other day they're back in the market, other day you know they're not in the market, and and it just seems like we haven't found a healthy medium where this is going to tank and just kind of be our new norm for as where rates we can expect them to be because on any given day a lot of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the rates can change from one day to another. If you saw last week, just like you know that quick. Yeah, and and what Brian's saying is really important to understand if you're in the market and you're looking to buy. Yes. home or you don't see your refinancing right now and you're looking at the mortgage market, talking to your loan officer, the, the the mortgage market can change every minute that the open market is open. So when the New York Stock Exchange is open and it's trading up and down, the bond market's open, those mortgage rates are vacillating as well, going up and down or sideways. And on the day where CPI got released last week and it was higher and hotter than expected, the bond market went up right away. Yeah. And you saw the 10-year Tank. yield jump from like I mean, 4.3, like all the way to 4.5 and, and then hang around 4.5 for a day and a half and then went past 4.5 a, a little bit. Well, when when that does when that happens that spills over uh, no, I shouldn't say spills over that correlates really strong with mortgage rates it's, it's historically had a, long, a large correlation and you know this is not what the Fed was expecting it's not what they were hoping for and it 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 it's I can't say it bo- it's blowing up in their face. It's not, that's a little bit extreme, but it does indicate that what they're hoping for is not happening at the speed they were wishing it would. Yeah, and I mean, and you're going to start seeing a lot of people digress from what they said about the rate cuts, the rate cuts, the rate cuts. I honestly maybe think that unless you know data gets a lot better by September, they might not even cut September and wait until December. I, I mean, I don't quote me, but I feel the way that things are and the way that I've been seeing this. It's not too far off to say that might happen. Look, it wasn't too long ago we sat on this show and we were talking, we were wagering, you, me, and Will, talking about, well, how many rate cuts are there going to be in 2024? I'm like, oh, there's going to be. God damn it, these going to be right. There's going to be there gonna be three. There's going to be four. And then, you know, the articles were saying six to eight. It's like, that's impressible. That yeah. was stupid from the beginning. But, uh, I, you know, we were already saying, oh, okay, I think there's going to be three or four because I thought we were going to start in April based on the data. When the Fed says we're going to be data reliant, we're going to be data dependent, and the data is now coming back and showing this, now you can't do it. Yeah. So there may only be. So, one or two. And a credit to them, you know, that they didn't drop rates this last time because, I mean, look at what came out. Well, I mean, right. <laughs> it would have it, it, it would then next make inflation even worse mm-hmm. uh, be, because of that. Now, the other part of this, too, and this is cited in the article, is that, you know, higher inflation coupled with lower and expected unemployment could result in the Fed keeping interest rates high. So we're already talking about interest rates being high. But the uh, uh, the lower than expected unemployment, remember, they stated that they need unemployment to be high. Yeah. Now, they say it in coded words. They say we need softening, softening in the labor, labor market. market. People okay. need to lose their jobs. So AKA. whenever you hear softening in the labor market, People that need means job. we need higher unemployment. So remember, they needed higher employment to trigger demand destruction. Yeah. And then demand destruction leads to lots of supply on shelves, unused inventory that then has to be marked down, which then brings back price stability. So it's this like domino effect. So if you have high, uh, softening in the labor market, which is code for high unemployment, then you have demand destruction. Demand destruction leads to higher inventory on shelves. Inventory mm. on shelves leads to price markdowns, which leads to lower prices, which leads the, the Fed back to saying that they have achieved price stability in the markets. So that's a lot of steps in between where we're at now and what wow. they're hoping to happen. Yep. Uh, but if that is still the game at play, when's that going to happen? Because now looking at this, what's going to happen? You, th- that means you still need more unemployment because it's been lower than expected, even though they've taken rates as high as they have for and kept them as long as they have. Now what do you do? So if that hasn't done the trick to get unemployment high, what would you have to do? So it goes perfect with what CEO of uh, uh, JP Morgan said, Jamie Dimon. It's going to be sticky. And I was actually listening to another podcast this week. So when I read this, I was like, wow. He's expecting, and they're the biggest bank in the United States, you know, hold over trillions of deposits. He's stating that, hey, we're not so out of this yet, and I don't even think we're even close to it. He's actually predicting that rates could go higher, pushing into the 8 to 9%. Then he took it back and said— Mortgage yeah, rates, mortgage yeah, rates, not the Fed rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he even went back and said, like, dude, this is still, on average, very low for the average of the last 50 years. He's like, you push back to the 50s and 80s. I mean, the 80s, the 90s rates were way, way, way more elevated. So the only issue here is that prices are still so high. So. Right. 
if that was to come down, these rates are nothing to be scared about because it's online with everything that's been averaged in the last 50 years. So I think that, you know, he might be actually right because with everything coming out, I'm not sure that it's going to go that high, but I do believe we're going to remain in elevated ranges for the remaining of the year. Yeah. No, we we will. Yeah. I mean, but the the thing is that this, and I know this is this. I've, I've been watching this in the comments too. Like this is crushing people. Yeah, you know, th this is crushing people that are working their full time job plus maybe a side hustle or two full time jobs. I mean, I literally just the other day was talking to a neighbor of mine who is working two full time jobs. He's mm -hmm. going to work early for one, pulling a morning to midday shift at one job full time, and then going to the second job doing an early afternoon to early evening shift for a second full time income. And he is in a house where. Five other people live, they all share rent, and he's renting a room there. So he's got two jobs and renting a room oh, inside our in our, our house. In our inside a house in our neighborhood. And that's what it takes for him to make it. He's single. He doesn't have any other expenses outside of his own personal expenses. Right. He does not have any children. And I'm talking about someone who's in their like late twenties. So that is, I know, only one example, but that is happening to a lot of people. This elevated interest rates for higher for longer is going to continue crushing people, especially in the middle class and the lower and and, and the poor, um, lower class, so poor, poor, whatever, economically disadvantaged, if you will. A hundred percent. I mean, the higher the rates go, you know, unfortunately, the people at the bottom of the barrel are the ones that you know hurt the most, and it's you know, it's a bad situation, but. Well, but even if you're making, let's say, good money, I'm gonna say good money. Let's say you're making a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about um, that. You know, folks need to have eighty percent more income in order to afford a home these days. Well, that that could be a married couple that combined make one hundred fifty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars, and it's still tight. I mean, I'm seeing articles online where people saying that even if they make one hundred fifty, one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, they're 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 check paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. like that's crazy. I met with the uh, with three siblings this past uh this last week and um i mean all of them wanted to buy a house and they're like hey they came to me they're like hey um so we all work individually we wanted to see what route would be the best should we all buy together or should we buy individually so we calculated their income one of them made forty three thousand a year the other one made fifty three thousand a year and the third one made sixty five thousand a year i mean right off the bat i looked at it you guys are probably better off buying together because now you have 161k income so now that puts you in the ballpark to actually be able to, you know, content to be able to buy something. And when I say content to be able to buy something, we're still working on their debts because even at 160K income, their debts are still holding them back for certain things to be able to buy. Yeah. So, you know, even at that income, you're still going to face certain obstacles with the rates being so high because of how much it eats up on your debt to income ratio. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it's, it's chewing away at your affordability. Oh, and, 100%. And you're, you're, not your affordability, chewing away at your purchase power. Yep. So, uh, and, that, and that is just likely to continue happening. Um, you know, the, the issue with the Fed is they're, stu they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Yep. Uh, if they leave rates where they're at, then it's going to just going to be pursuant for longer. If they increase rates, then they really got a tuck tail and they're going to take a black eye in the media and in public because they really got it wrong. Um, and then if they reduce rates too soon or too quickly, then they will not achieve unemployment that they need in order to create demand destruction to get price stability back. And then price spikes will happen again. Uh, and again, I know they're trying to achieve this like leveling off, but as long as we're in positive territory when it comes to month over month inflation and year over year inflation, it's still growing. It's not stabilized. It's not flattened. And for people who don't take a close enough look at this, the charts are really disingenuous because the chart looks like it goes like this. It goes up, Brian, and it kind of levels and it goes down. But it's a positive growth chart. It's not a it's not a zero media it's not a zero midline Still waistline with positive numbers and lower numbers. It's just it's just a chart of positive only. And so it's it represents growth and speed. It does not represent contraction at all. So, uh, um, but it looks a, like it does. <laughs> I, I heard an interesting, uh, and maybe a little bit of subject. I heard, you know, what if we were to go back and I wanted to ask you this, Andy, what if we were to go back to the gold standard and one of the arguments that they brought up is like, wait, 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 are you watching like Peter Schiff videos? Or yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, geez. How did you know? Because he's, you want, you want because he's, been, he's been talking about the gold standard for like, yeah, forever. So, I mean, I, I, I fell across that video that, uh, he was talking about. He's like there. And I was curious because he said, if we go back to the gold standard, then we can't run a deficit, meaning that there's no, you know, running deficit, bringing debt. What does that mean, Andy? There's a massive rabbit hole you're about to go down in this conversation. Like this is an entire show talking about the gold standard being backed by gold. Where is all the gold actually, by the way? Okay. So my, so my, <laughs> I'm not going to be conspiratorial. I don't know where the gold is. I'm not sure that if anyone knew where the gold is, the public would be told where the where gold is. Where is the gold? Number one. Number two, 
um, I don't know that for the amount of gold that, let's say, physically is in existence oh. and is held, you could attribute that and correlate that to how much deficit we're running in the tr- mm. you know thirty some odd trillion right now, because then that would ba- you would need to have that much gold at its current price in order to equate Back that up. standard. So there'd be some sort of ratio, one to one, two to one, whatever it is. So there's that that issue. Number two. Um, Gold is traded on the open market, so you can actually trade physical gold, you can trade paper gold, mm. and so you can hold gold on your portfolio without actually even having material gold in your possession. So the tradability of gold is something else that you have to, because it has volatility too. Right. So right, right. gold, the gold price reacts to the market when inflation comes in hot or cold, and employment goes up, and you know world events happen, so it's exposed to the market. I think the real issue when I hear about the gold thing is that we came off of the gold standard a long mm. time ago which then neg- kind of, you can argue now looking backwards, it really negated any sort of mon- monetary policy you would want to have after that. Because, oh, if it's off the gold standard, then you can kind of do whatever you want. And then we're only beholden to the people that hold our debt. So whoever's holding all our debt are the ones we have to answer to, not to some standard. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So let's say uh, foreign <laughs> countries own trillions of dollars of our debt. Well, then that's who we have to answer to. We don't have to answer to our people and to the gold standard we have set. Because they're the ones that... We even pay though, the bills too. E- we pay every month. We even have to. though we owe trillions of debt to these countries that are holding our debt, well, we just have to tell our people that they're going to make it and their dollar still goes a long way, which it doesn't. So the, the, the devaluation, sense. the dollar is part of this. I know I gave you a long answer. You didn't even ask for it. But that's, no, I did. That's now, a whole now, different topic. Now I have stuff I have to go to do some research. That's on. a whole different. It's a whole different topic. <laughs> we'll be back next week with the so, gold standard update. So with Realtor.com, uh, you know the shelter inflation is the is about a third of the goods and services services that are measured in the consumer price index. So things associated with shelter inflation, and you know we have to have food, clothing, water, shelter. Those are our like core necessities as, as people. Um, other things like you know transportation and food and those kinds of I mean I just mentioned food but like yeah. fa- fast food like, yeah. like the things that we go out and to do uh, outside of our like core necessities um, you know those those don't carry as much weight as the shelter connected things and the shelter connected things are going to drag the market for very long now I also saw that there has been deflation in certain categories mm-hmm. and certain um, raw goods and also in certain um, uh, farm goods. But those deflationary numbers are only taking those goods back to where they were from plus 40%. So, for example, I'll use, um, I think apples came in. Like, apples is down 10%. Okay, that's great. So, year over year, apples is down 10%. I'm going to short apples. But when apples were up 30%, and then I'm down 10% from that, that's not actually cheaper, as cheap as it was before it's, before it inflated 30%. You're just back you to where saying? it was the most affordable at the most recent time. Well, yeah, you, yeah. Well, you, you clawed back a little bit of it, but if your weight goes up, again, if your weight goes up 30% and then it goes down 10%, <laughs> you're still up heavier, 20. <laughs> you're still heavier than when you started. So that is the, that is the point. And, and such goes- But we don't talk about that 20, we just talk so, about that 10% loss. <laughs> so, so, such as it goes with mortgage rates. Mortgage yeah. rates are going to walk in lockstep with what inflation does because that's what it's going to do. For those who are looking to get into the market, it's still going to be a long-term play. It's going to be something you have to buy and hold and be committed to. Yeah. Uh, it is definitely not a fly-by-night decision right now. Nope. Okay. Should you refinance your mortgage? Here are three signs it's time, real estate experts say. Uh, homeowners who took out a mortgage in recent years as rates hovered around 6 and 7 and even touched 8% are paying attention for opportunities to refinance. Uh, refinance activity rose 2.9% in February compared with last year, Freddie Mac found. However, fewer owners might refinance their loans as they might still be locked in on historically low rates or may see little incentive to do so, the mortgage buyer forecasts. So, Brian, the article states three signs it may be smart to refinance. In order, they are. You can cut your rate by 50 uh, fifty basis points or more. You can pay cash for closing costs, and you bought your home with FHA loan. So let's start at the top. Uh, you have number one, you can cut your rate by 50 basis points or more. That's half a percent for everyone watching. If you can reduce your rate by half a percent, the article is suggesting that this is a good idea. I like this, especially in the first 24 or 36 months of your ownership. Yeah. So with this one is, um, especially right now, if this is a play that you're looking to get into and uh, you probably bought on the high end of the market last year... Um, even if you're going to be staying in the house for, let's say, more than five years, there's going to be a cost associated with the refinance, right? And you might have to buy, bring your rate down a little bit more or, you know, buy the rate down to come down to 50 uh, half basis points. But 
if you're going to be in the house for over five years, it's going to make sense for you to, you know, get that lower payment because you'd be recuperating that investment that you're taking on that lower rate. But now let's say if you're, hey, you're, you're, you're going to be making a move within those five years, then you're probably better off just, you know, taking whatever rate or not refinancing if you can make the payment right now and just write it out until you could just get a full on savings or get rid of the uh, house if you're going to be exiting that investment. Yeah, that's a good point. And so let's let's put that in the context yeah. for everyone watching who maybe you're wondering if you can refinance and if you if the market is um, half a percent lower than what your current rate is. So let's say, for example, you bought a house in uh, October of 2023 mm -hmm. when the rates were at the all-time well not their all-time high when they were at their highest in the last like 40 years um if you bought a house in october of 2023 12 months is coming up soon so maybe this summer you can start looking at where rates are at let's say you got a rate at seven and a half percent that means if the market's at seven percent this is something you can consider i'm not saying you should it's something that you can consider so i have an example last year we actually locked in a client at 8.375 Woo! Yeah, eight point three seven five. But this was a special occasion because he did a bank statement loan. But this mm, was exactly okay. well, what we explain that. So a bank statement loan is uh, essentially instead of utilizing your tax returns for you know proving your income, what we do is we take twenty four or twelve months of your bank statements and then verify uh, deposits that are being uh, able to use to get you know qualify your income and then utilize those so that it allows you to use your real time income and be able to use as much of it. So we went that route to be able to prove them from a higher amount. It does come at a higher uh, down payment, but he was okay because he was coming in with 20 percent yeah. either way so the rate was higher 8.375 but i had mentioned to him like hey this is just a temporary bandit it's just a play to get you in because we can't approve you for the amount that you want with your regular taxes um to go to the regular route so we're setting him up that in i want to say maybe by the end of this month we're going to be starting his refinance because now rates are below 8.375 and we could take that savings down to maybe a six and a quarter maybe six and a half oh that's a huge which thing. would be a huge savings for him because he's at 8.375 so if that's a situation like yours then you could really still you know save that money because you're whatever way you put it you're saving almost two percent right well, so even if you're going from a four to a two, you're going from eight to a six, it's still a good amount of savings for your payment. Yeah, proportionally, they're way different. Yeah. But but yeah, 2% yeah, 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 is amazing. I mean, yeah. the article even cites that tr traditionally, if the market is offering you 1% less than what you currently have, like that's like strike, Do like it. strike while the iron's hot. In this case, part of the consent, kind of part of the, um, let's say, um, what do you, what, the, not the consensus, but uh, what I'm trying to say, part of the condition mm -hmm. is that what you're going to give up by going for 50 basis points is the market might not give it back to you again. So if the market is half percent lower, don't roll the dice and hope for it to go more if the Fed's not moving. If the Fed is moving marching rates down, then sure, hold your hold your breath for a couple more months and then lower rates will still come. But if the Fed has to hold, then if it's half a percent lower then take it and and that's where i feel that headlines now like more than ever if they haven't shown you that they're not going to be 100 percent true you need to be very active in the information that you're following because if you if you see now like you can't just go into it blindly expecting that you're going to have a low rate regardless of what it is like now every little last number in detail could make or break your deal so you have to be ultra yeah. sensitive to the information you're intaking and who you're taking it from because that could dictate a lot of the process and you know the success of your transaction and so right now we're talking to people who bought their house maybe in 2021 or 2022. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that in 2021, 2022, rates were still lower. I get that. But in cases where, like Brian's talking about, you had 20% down, you did bank statement loan. So again, with the bank statement loan, there is a higher interest rate because the risk to the lender is higher yes. because there is... I'm not going to say unverified income, but it's not the type of income that they deem. Cons uh, I would say like traditional, traditional income that you could yes. you know, verify. You know. Saying, <laughs> trying to think of the word. Traditional source of income yeah, like yeah. W-2s and pay stubs and salary, that kind of thing. So exactly. um, that is why the interest rate is, is higher. But even if you had 8% or 7.5% and, and it's now at 7 quarter, 7% or 675 you're in the money, if you will. As long yeah. as you bought your house in the last 24, 36 months, I think it's worth considering. Uh, item number two from this article is you can pay cash for closing costs. Now, uh, there are closing costs associated with a loan if you have to redo your loan or do a refinance. Um, but what I was going to say here is also typically what's happening is you are like skipping a mortgage payment. You're not yeah. really skipping a mortgage payment because anyways, in your closing costs are going to be your interest and your prepaid interest, prepaid and interest and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. But my point is, let's say you're paying $3,500 a month for your mortgage and you're refinancing your home and your closing costs are $3,500 uh, $3, to close your loan. Well, if you are not making your mortgage payment in the month that you are doing your loan, then you've basically paid your mortgage by saving $3,500 to go toward your closing costs, yep. thus making it so that your new closing costs aren't rolled into your new loan amount. Yeah. 
and and I thought this was an interesting uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, play because usually a lot of people are now used to just rolling it into their uh, into the into the refinance and you know calling it a day. But right now with you know with everything being so elevated, this might be a better solution because then you could still take the full on savings without having to tack in more into your loans yes. and additionally leverage perhaps a lower term because you're not putting in more 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 into that. It so could you be a can lower bring term. Lower term at what you started paying mm -hmm. at. So if you you already paid it five years in, refinance it at twenty five years and then you yeah. could pay your closing costs and you'll see the difference and you know without adding more money into your loan. And the other thing too is remember that if you are paying your own closing your own closing costs out of pocket really as we say, idea. then your balance is essentially the same. Yeah. So if you owe four hundred thousand dollars today and you refinance but pay your closing costs out of pocket, you can still do a loan for four hundred thousand dollars and still have that same loan a ba loan balance with a lower monthly payment. But because the interest rate is lower, you actually will pay off sooner than the original orig origination date of maturity from your pre your prior loan. So for example, here in San Diego, if you're looking to do a refinance, you're probably going to cost you anywhere between maybe ten to twelve thousand. You know, prepaid, escrow, loan costs, basically the whole thing, right? So you have the option of putting that into the loan, but if you're able to slash that, then that's a savings right there that you're taking up front without having to tack it into your loan. Yeah. And I think that's actually a really good, really good plan because no one ever really does it. It's just like, hey, re re put it into your loan. It's okay. You don't have to pay anything out of pocket. But right now, what I'm noticing is that if you're able to pay it up front, the savings is going to be a lot better and it will make sense for you to be able to get that savings and if you want. I think that's the difference between what, what, sells a loan versus what is smart in the loan. And yeah. I'm not saying that it's unsmart to do that. It might be the only way you can if you yeah. don't have the money. Yeah. But my point is, sometimes people are just sold the loan that way. Oh, hey, I'll do your refinance. No cost out of pocket. No problem. Easy, yeah. easy, right? Keep it clean. And that's fine. But if that's not what's best for the buyer, or, or not buyer, if that's not what's best for the homeowner and the borrower, then you still have to suggest and let them know, here's this other alternative. You yeah. can pay part of your closing costs, all your closing costs, and do whatever is best in the overall picture of what they're trying to achieve. That's more yes. of a mortgage plan approach rather than just sell the loan and whatever. And that's what I feel right now the climate calls for. It's more of a personalized mortgage plan for you than rather than like, let's just roll the dice, let me get into something. doesn't matter what the price is, the rate's so low that I'll worry about it later. Well, right now, everything kind of really matters. Yeah. yeah. And and also with you know, paying your own closing costs, you know, this this is the same for FHA loans and VA loans. Uh, if, if you can, if you are allowed to, and if you can afford to, then you can still pay them if you're doing an FHA Streamline or a VA Earl, uh, you can do that as well. And I encourage you, if you are on the, on the on the fence of you know running some numbers and noting uh wanting to refinance to take cash out or just to see what it looks like definitely get that done because it's going to give you a lot of clarity don't you know go to your trusted loan officer and get that information because it could benefit you believe me or not even if you're paying uh seven percent on your mortgage and you're still paying a 70 percent of your credit card maybe another like 10 percent on your car like you're paying a higher interest rate and other things that you might seem like they're lower but in the end you're paying a lot more so definitely take a look into that yeah that's uh, definitely more of an advanced strategy but definitely necessary and yeah. also one that we're doing here at the office i know you've talked to a number of people where yes. it is that high car balance and that high car payment and that high car interest rate that high credit card rate uh, and high balance so uh the third thing in this article is you brought your home with fha loan and I, I add here or VA. So if you buy your home with FHA or VA, this kind of dovetails to my point a minute ago about mm -hmm. the Streamline and the Earl. Uh, the FHA Streamline and the VA Earl are both options for you. Now you can either go from your FHA to a new FHA, mm -hmm. your VA to VA, or you can go from your FHA VA into a conventional loan. Now in the case of people who have an FHA loan, and it's not just, oh, is the rate half a percent better? It's, well, maybe there's enough equity in my house that I can refinance out of my FHA into a conventional loan because I'm at the 80% LTV. I have 20% equity now. Yes. Maybe I only had 5% down or 10% down when I used my FHA two or three years ago. Well, guess what? Where are property values? They're higher. They're elevated. So if you have 20% of your equity right now and you want to get out of your FHA loan and you can get into a conventional loan without the mortgage insurance premium, you might actually be saving money. Because, I mean, think about it. Right off the bat, on average, you're going to be paying on uh, on average maybe anywhere from 200 to 400 depending on your- A month. A month. A month on top of your mortgage payments, just in mortgage insurance. Then, then you're still paying that higher rate. So sometimes you're, it's a double savings. You get a lower rate and you wipe off two to 400 bucks off your monthly payment. So- 
that could that could make or break somebody. And and this goes back to you know kind of the previous point, uh, another previous point where it's like if you can save that money cumulative and you've done that in the first 24 or 36 months of yes. your ownership, you're still going to end up winning in the end because you'll either be uh, paying off your your loan you know sooner if you will or with less interest. Yes. So or le- less total interest paid and less out of pocket paid. So if you can get into conventional, great. If you can just do this FHA streamline. Or the VA Earl, which is short for the VA Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan. That's cool. Uh, I feel like that's redundant. I don't know if they need to see a refinance, but okay. Uh, anyways, the Earl, uh, then those are two options that you can do a refinance as long as the market is favorable. Specifically with the VA Earl, your payment must go down by 5% or more. Otherwise, the VA will not endorse the loan and it cannot be offered to you. Yeah. Um, with the VA, same thing. It's The great thing about the VA is that you, we don't need your income. We just need to verify that you're still working. We simply take your rate down and basically help you get some savings. So yeah. it's pretty yep. streamlined if yeah. you ask me. Yep. So I think a couple of good options there for this, um, you know, for those of you looking to refinance, it sounds crazy. It's like, why the heck would you refinance in this market? Well, well some people bought in the fall of 2023 well, or we, the summer of 2023. We had a client, we refinanced from a 7.625 to a 6.375 last year. Wow, and it's a VA Earl. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the, the one, yeah I remember yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one and a half percent difference. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, like, this guy was crazy. Like, Jesus. Yeah, that's a lot of money every yeah. month to save, especially here in San Diego. These loan balances. That was. Oh my god. All right, next, Brian. We have one million dollar homes are now typical in a record number of U.S. cities. Analysis I finds. It. I believe Here's it. Here's where they it. are. Okay, the United States had five hundred and fifty. $550 million cities or areas where the typical home is worth more than a million dollars in February, according to new analysis by Zillow. There's a record number of areas in the U.S. where the typical home is worth $1 million or more. They had $550 million cities where the typical home value is a million or more, um, and that is a gain of 59 cities from 2023. So plus 59 cities since 2023. Forget six-figure cities. We want multi-million dollar cities. Yeah, we got seven, <laughs> seven, seven-figure seven, neighborhoods or seven-figure zip codes. Oh, what, um, what do you got in your zip code? <laughs> so first uh, so first question slash comment is, uh, hey, where's the crash dooms theirs? Okay. Uh, ne- <laughs> Troll. I know, I'm just trolling super hard. But I am going to get to places where there's actually a lot, um, there is like softening the market. So let's talk about this part first, though. So if you look at the chart here, you see in 2022, in July, uh, there was 538 cities that were millionaire cities. And from then, there was like that little dip that corresponded with that 10% national correction, the summer of 22, remember? So the yeah. summer of 22 to like the fall of 22, there was like this little correction. Everyone thought, oh, here comes the crash. No, it was a correction. It was about 10% average. That's just me using easy numbers for the show. But now here we are back to February 2024. Now we're at 550 cities that uh, have a million dollar uh, status or more. And that's net. That includes, that number still includes any areas that have fallen off that list. Say they were at a million and five, and now they're at 999 thousand that those numbers are out so this is still a net figure this isn't some like rolling total um i mean it is a, it's a rolling number but it's not cumulatively adding it's taking on, adding on and taking off so you still had cities that rolled off of this list in that same t- time frame as well brian that's ridiculous i just feel like <laughs> since 2012 13 just been going up well we talked about this last yeah. week on the show in 2014 to 2024 the home, median home prices doubled ridiculous it's just straight up i just drew a line i'm like yeah straight up line <laughs> <laughs> i'm like wow yeah shortest distance between two points is a straight line i should have went long on the housing market <laughs> so what Cal- was i doing <laughs> california has the most million dollar cities with 210 so of the 550 <laughs> 210 of them are in california woo <laughs> woo that's uh that's gosh that's just about 40 percent. so uh, the next five runner-up states check this out this is a crazy Jesus. statistic the next five combined are less than California. So New York, New Jersey, Florida, Massachusetts, and Colorado make up less million-dollar cities than California's 210. It's ridiculous. I mean, I've been at houses these last couple of weeks, and every house that I've been at, open house, or just walked here in the neighborhoods, and they're not in crazy areas either. The the prices are all above a million dollars. You walk in the house, some of them are like, okay, yeah, it could be worth it. Others are just kind of like, 
Well, you're lucky you're in this neighborhood. <laughs> well, but uh, but hold on. Okay, for clarification for everyone watching, you're not or, talking about a million and one dollars. No, I'm talking you, about you, 1. You, 3, 1. Yeah. 1. 2, 1. 7, right. 1. 8. And, and this is in the these are the neighborhoods that when I was growing up, they were 175. This is like in the late 80s. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Early night, 180,000, 200,000. This is you know 25, 30 years ago now that we're at 1.3 in Bonita. I mean, yeah. I was in a lot of Bonita houses this past week, and and although it's an older community, the prices all hold their value. And if anything, it looks like they're going higher because every other Bonita house I see pop up, I'm like, yo, whoa. And then I go see And a my- lot of them don't have HOA. So yep. even though it's $1.3 million, let's say that's, oh, it's a really high monthly expense. Well, so is $500 a month for HOA, number one. Number two, you can build an ADU on it. So you have the ability to do that. You have more space typically. Oh, a And lot. there's a lot of one-story homes in Bonita so compared much. to the newer developments that were here in Otay Ranch and Eastlake and Rolling Hills. I mean, just so you get a, a, a um, an idea of how much it is that you'll pay in property taxes for a new development. Like right now, we're approving somebody between the ranges of eight hundred dollars to 900000 You're going to be paying on a new development anywhere between a thousand and fourteen hundred just in per property month. taxes per Melrose, month per month on top of your principal and interest homeowners insurance which is not going to be cheap because it's a new house no mortgage insurance all that good stuff yeah you're so th- those of you watching this part of the show and you're looking to buy in san diego the the san diego county base rate of tax is one percent so one percent of the assessed value not appraised value not purchase price value, the assessed value one percent of the assessed value is your base tax rate on top of that is any local and local and municipal bond uh things that have been voted on or yep, that are yep. tucked in there there's like mosquito and pest control and the Vector. school districts and all that kind of stuff that add up to mm-hmm. 1.1, 1.2, all in. But the base tax rate is 1% of the assessed value. 100%. So in this $1.3 million home in Bonita, you're talking about $13,000 a year of base tax rate. <laughs> Just in itself. That's Yeah. So you have states that have uh, lost uh, lost a couple of, I'll say, I'll say a handful of neighborhoods or zip codes that are lower than a million dollars now. But again, this is not evidence of a crash. It could be a correction or it could be softening or it could be that demand is now shown up or not demand, that supply has shown up in some of these areas. Also, I think the mass migrations that we saw a couple of years ago have mostly slowed. Yeah. I know that there's still a lot of people leaving California and they're leaving other areas that they don't want to be in um, for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to get into, but uh, I know that there is going to be um, probably more places added to the million dollar city list versus being taken off. Oh, hundred percent. And uh, I mean, houses are just continuously going up. I mean, I don't see it slowing down. It's not going to go up forever, but for the time being, if- well, and you have to remember, and sorry, I didn't clarify my point that some of these are legacy. They're legacy areas. Beverly Hills. Oh yeah. Malibu. That's, that's very good point. You know, Costa Mesa, Orange County, Del Mar, La Jolla. That you have some places on this list that will never go below a million dollars because the brand. <laughs> they're already at three, at four, and five Just million dollars. Right. So you know what's what's happening is you have suburbs that are entering into this threshold, but these let's say um, higher cost areas like New York City. How about Miami? You know, there's gonna be places that they're just legacy anyway. So there's a certain portion of these in that number of 550 Brian that they're always they're just going to be that way. And I feel San Diego for that matter is like now one of those cities that just regardless you're going to be paying for the location, you're going to be paying for San Diego along with the, you know, I call it the San Diego tax, you're paying for just being in the city. Yeah, and mm. and yeah, San Diego continues to add numbers to that list. I mean, you have I think Carlsbad is over a million dollars now. I want to say obviously Cor- Coronado. Poway, I think will be up there as well. Yeah, you're going to have like Coronado, Rolling Hills yeah. Ranch, Bonita, East Lake, the Hill, I mean the uh, Bonita. Rolling Hills. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got the woods over here that's going to be over a million dollars easy oh my god and so so yeah there's going to be uh more of this not less i think the number the number of places that are falling off the list are going to be fewer one thing that uh um, you know for all the crashes out there you know how we're talking about you know the increase of your weight and how you drop 10 percent, but you're still up 20 (laughs) percent So, you know, for house prices, you know, they'd have to go lower than where they were pre-pandemic after right. they spoke up to call it a crash because now we're just, you know, still positive, just coming down from a high. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry so, to use your... <laughs> no, it's okay. We're Easy math. <laughs> uh, join us next week's show. We're going to weigh Andy live on camera. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, there, I'm gonna start say I'm gonna start talking about my weight in pre-pandemic and post-pandemic terms. It just uh, it, 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 I feel it's something that people can you know connect with, and they're like, oh yeah, I, I know about my weight. I feel yeah. like I know about my weight. <laughs> All right, uh, so um, yeah, so million dollar cities is is the way it's gonna be. The only way this is going to get better for people is if more more supply comes on the market. But in most areas where there's already million dollar homes still exchanging hands, Jesus. there's enough demand to soak it up. There's qualifying people to soak it up. Um, and in more inventory may only dent that price by a little bit, but not enough to take it below the list for dent. long. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think this is just going to grow. We could probably see uh, another 10% by next year, maybe, you know, so instead of 550, it's like 605. That would be crazy, but I, I would not, uh, I wouldn't be surprised by that. Mm-mm. All right, Brian. Last article of the day is U.S. home investor share reached all-time high in... No, I'm sorry. That's not correct. That's not what it says. It says U.S. home investor share reached new high in quarter four of 2023. Now, hold on. You're like, hey, it's uh, the middle of April. Why are we talking about data from quarter four? This is from CoreLogic. They literally released this April 9th. So CoreLogic is very thorough and very efficient. And after having collected all this data, they provided a very thorough report with lots of graphs and explanation. And that is why in April of 2024, it's coming out with the conclusions of quarter four 2023. So what they found is the investor share of purchases climbed to almost 29% in December of 2023 and could exceed 30% in 2024. The share of U.S. home investors hit a new high in December. In October, November, and December, the share of single-family home purchases that were made by investors was 28%. 27.3 27.3 and 28.7 respectively, which eclipsed the previous all-time high of 28.3% in February 2023 and makes the investor share rising above 30 in 2024 a distinct possibility. BlackRock's buying everything. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I wrote a note here and I said, buyers waiting for another correction, investors are not. So buyers, beware. We've talked about this a number of times. We take a lot of crap in the comments about this. I know not everybody can buy. We obviously have an affordability problem. Last week, someone was talking about we're playing in some sandbox that, no, that they're not playing in. I'm like, look, we pay all the same prices you do at the store. We carry our own expenses as a business. We have to earn our own income just like you do, whether it's paid for by your boss and your business or we have to go and earn it ourselves. Look, right. so... Anyways, the point is, if you're a buyer waiting on the sidelines for prices to correct, investors are not doing that. Investors are clearly showing that they are willing to buy and hold. And there's even a part of this that we're going to jump to in a second where investors are selling to each other. Yeah. So it's an investor to investor purchase. So like, oh yeah, um, I'll more, take this deal. Yeah. The, the number of uh, n- number of uh, real estate um, number of closings transactions is increasing year over year. There's a percentage of that that's investor to investor sales. So that's also happening. Be wary of that. So uh, the connection between price appreciation and investor activity has been inconsistent over the past few years. But elevated interest rates have uh, stymied appreciation, but not the number of investors. There seem to be more investors coming to the market. So um, investors now have mostly returned to their pre-pandemic levels of activity. Um, and that's a uh, and that shows a stark contrast to owner occupied buyers who are purchasing about a hundred thousand fewer homes per month than they were in twenty twenty two. So or below before twenty twenty two. One thing I've learned with uh, you know working with investors, but also working with residential buyers, is that investors aren't looking at you know purchasing an investment with an emotional lens. You know they're looking at it for what it is. If the numbers make sense and I'm able to make the margin that I'm looking for, or even in the ballpark that I am okay and I could take this investment, they're gonna buy all day regardless of the market, the rate, or what anyone else is saying because they already know they're playing what they're looking for, and in the realm of what's happening, they're able to attain that. Unfortunately, you know, if you're a residential buyer, you're you're really looking at this through an emotional lens that you're like you're you're investing your hard earned money every month in month out that you you earn and you know a hundred bucks two hundred bucks could make the difference, whereas you know investors look at it like I can eat two hundred bucks right now because I know down the line I'll be able to profit so I'm okay with that right now. That's the two different routes where you know for regular buyers they run out of you know pocket or they run out of you know ability to be able to withhold those higher rates, higher payments for a long time. So they double think it if they're going to get in the market. Yeah. This look, look, man, this comes down to buyer versus investor. You know, you're not just in the market to compete against another buyer. Now we talked about this in in the last show. I was, I was basically closing out the show saying, look, if you're a buyer and you like a home in San Diego right now, you're not the only one that loves that home. 
that now also includes, if you're a buyer and you're buying it for your own purposes, you're also potentially competing against an investor that wants it for their portfolio. Yeah, So 100%. That is someone you could be in the arena with. We've talked about this in previous shows too, where the amount of cash purchases is actually increased because rates are less favorable. And so, and also there's other, there's other things to compete with when it comes to sellers choosing the best offer. You can cash and close in a lot faster time yeah. versus someone who has to get a loan, get an appraisal, get an inspection. These cash buyers are making all sorts of, like waiving all sorts of concessions of in inspection even. <laughs> like even certain repairs, um, because again, if they can get the house out of your hands, in a lot of cases, or not I shouldn't say a lot, but in some cases, it's the buyer versus the investor in yeah. the arena. Yep. All right. So I'm going to read this one out because I want to make sure I say it correctly. In 2021, uh, the line that slopes upward, and I'll put this on the screen, the line that slopes upward showing that counties were higher appreciation that year had a larger investor presence. In 2022, the line is flatter, showing that a higher investor share still predicted strong appreciation, but not the same extent as 2021. And then for 2023, the line slopes down showing that this trend reversed and higher investor presence is predicted lower appreciation last year. Here's my point. It's still appreciation. So again, this is about speed of appreciation, not change of direction. And I want to make sure I'm making this very clear. Investors buying at the current market rate will keep prices where they're at or push them higher. It does not make them lower. If a investor gets a discount on a deal, that doesn't necessarily mean that discount is going to be copy and pasted and applied to every other home in that neighborhood and every other home in that in that zip code. It's got a good deal. It's not a group. <laughs> it's not a Groupon. Just because an investor gets ten percent off on a on a deal or twenty percent off because they're buying a dilapidated house, that doesn't mean that all property values sink. Property values are a cumulative response to what has recently been sold, but there are also uh, appraisal conditions or not conditions appraisal variables i'll put i'll put it that way that weigh in on whether or not that house that was discounted can even be comparable to yours yeah. that is maybe up to up to code one uh, num updated num number two has a pool versus doesn't and needs to be torn down and started from scratch so there's other things in the numbers that suggest uh, that the a discount that they may have got doesn't necessarily mean prices go down and i want to be very careful here I want to make sure it's very clear. Speed of appreciation is what we're talking about. We're not talking about change of direction, appreciation versus depreciation. No, but I feel like when when investors take over a property, that speed that you're talking about gets you know gets put into into, into motion because of the fact that they come in, they do things to the property that makes it appreciate real fast, rather than somebody that's just paying their house over time and it's going up slowly. They instantly give it you know equity or build up that that value in it. Well, yeah. So in the, so yeah, in that case, let's say an investor comes in and gets. A, gets a, a house with a massive haircut. Let's say twenty percent off. Mm. So let's say it's a, it's a million dollar neighborhood, and you get it for eight hundred thousand dollars. Nice. Well, but then you dump one hundred fifty thousand dollars into it to bring it like to code or to bring it up to snuff, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the the what you do by adding that one hundred fifty thousand dollars, let's say it keeps it at a million. Yeah. In value, or takes it to a million fifty or a million one Whatever. million one hundred. Yeah then it's stabilizing, it's actually stable, re, re-stabilizing the neighborhood because bringing it current and keeping its creating a leveling off feature or maybe an increased appreciation feature. Not and, just, oh, I'm buying a crappy house and I'm leave it that way. No. And, and, you know, and in some cases, I mean, not everybody's going to look at it like this, but, you know, some investors do come into neighborhoods and make them a little bit better by bringing, you know, better, you know, how, how to say the houses look a lot better. People want to come into the neighborhoods and it's going to help lift the values of the neighborhoods all around. So that I think prompts a little bit. It, it can, but let's let, look, let's not let, let's not give big investors. Let's not let them off the hook. Okay. You, you start, you literally gave me a one word answer. When I read the title, you're like BlackRock, well, okay? like, BlackRock, Blackstone, all these guys. Look, I, I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not friends with these guys. Okay. I'm on the side of homeowners getting homes. Right. My point in bringing that up though, is that if you already own a home in that neighborhood and there's a, a dumpy house on your street well, and that dumpy house gets bought and a buyer doesn't get it, or uh, let's say a regular borrower doesn't get it and an investor buys it, but they bring it up. Okay. Maybe you got done a favor, but again, I'm not going to say that puts them in my good grade because they're buying too many homes. Here's why. <laughs> Number of home investors that bought from other investors reached almost 19% in December. That's about a fifth. Think of one out of every five homes. Uh, go to page 10. Yeah. So jump to page 10. 
Look at that. Number of home investors that bought from other investors reached almost 19% in December. This number has ebbed and flowed from 16 to 19% over the past few years. Investors also make around 10% of their purchases on new homes and resell around 15% of their real estate portfolios. So if they resell 15%, Brian, how much are they keeping? Five. No. If they resell 15% of their total, how many are they keeping? 85%. Oh, yeah. That means they're holding on to 85%. So again, back to you people saying, uh, we're going to like get these ha- these houses out of the clenches of their hands. Probably not. Uh, so given that investors buy around 900,000 homes per year, a loose calculation would put around 300,000 of homes moving from owner-occupied to investor owners in any given year. That's a lot. You Jesus. think about all that inventory that I'm, I'm going to say it's being kept as keep away that isn't, isn't coming to the market for a borrower that we could be qualifying. They're or just, that we have qualified that's competing against everyone else because there's low, low supply. But they're making the deals happen under... Right. So there's a, there's a, there's a subsection of the, of the market which is not even making itself available. Or, well, hold on. That's not, that's not entirely true. Let me say this correctly. It could be making itself available to the market by being listed, but it's still being bought by an investor. Yeah. It could also just be investor to investor, an off-market sale where I'm not even going to put it on the market. I'm just going to sell you my book of X amount of homes and whatever. So it could be pocket deals like we call them, yeah. or it could be hitting the market, but it still ends up being an investor versus a, a regular borrower. But not, you know, one out of every five is a lot. I mean, even one out of every six or seven is still quite substantial when it comes to the percentage that they're buying and selling to and from each other. Uh, Last thing on here is the, well, no, there's two more things actually. Sorry. Next to last in. The home flipper and iBuyer activity continued downward trends. So I'm not surprised by this. Um, only 12% of investors who purchased a home in March of 2023 were resold by the end of December. Only 12%. Again, I, to my point, how many do they hold then? 88% of those are holds. And I think that's also because, I mean, I if they invested that much into it, there's probably that not that much profit yet. So they have to wait until either they can refinance and take their money out or wait for it to go up a little bit more in value. Right. But what do they do along the way? What are they collecting every They're month along the way? They're collecting rent. Which, yeah. I, at the end of the day, I mean, for them, it doesn't matter. They're skinning the cat different ways. They're going to get that cat skin and get whatever that is that yeah. they want. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell you a funny story real quick. So uh, shout out to my friend, Make a Move Mike, Mike Harris. Hey. Dude, Mike Harris posted this story last week on Instagram and he's like walking through this house in Spring Valley. I think I want to say it was Spring Valley. And uh, it was just like showing. He couldn't even get to a part of the house. And I, I literally in the comments was like, that house needs a bulldozer taken to it. It was it was real bad. How much was it selling for? Uh, he didn't say. Yeah, or it wasn't in the video. He didn't uh, okay. say say how much it was. It's it's a deal they already have. And he was just walking it, showing the video. I'm like, this place is a dump. <laughs> it's a dump. But that's again, that's what these flippers are looking for. That's a place you that's, can literally bulldoze. That's a gold mine for somebody. Down, <laughs> down to the foundation, rebuild it. It's going to be restored in the neighborhood. Because I'm telling you, Brian, this place didn't look like it had been lived in for maybe five or ten years oh, minimum. Gosh. And even in the quick glimpses I got, like the inside the wall, the inside the wall was just, it was, uh, the, the framing was like eaten away and it was rotted and it had mold. It was, dis- wow. <laughs> it was, dis- it was disgusting. And I wasn't even there. This is me watching it through my screen. It was disgusting. gross. So the, I'm, I'm not going to say that there isn't room for home buying or home, home flippers anymore. I'm just saying that what it is showing here in this CoreLogic report is that it has been uh, on a downward trend, uh, and I'm not surprised by that. It is definitely hard work. Anyone who thinks it's easy to take an entire house and flip it and put it back on the market and remain profitable, uh, you must also be really good at it, because if you're just sitting that and saying that from your couch, good luck to you. Watching HGTV. <laughs> huh, good luck. I, I, <laughs> good luck. I, could, I could do this. I could yeah, do that. A, home, a home flip happens in wow. tw- 20 minutes oh. with a, with commercials in between, mm. right? I could really do this. Yeah, 30-minute show distilled down to 21 minutes. <laughs> I had my sister the other day uh, um, as I was posting houses. She's like, uh, do you guys take a- cash? And can we buy no contingencies? How fast can we close? I replied back to her, who let you watch a uh, uh, Selling Sunset here, huh? <laughs> like, God. Jesus. Um, all right. So the final part on this, Brian, is California led the U.S. for home investor share in 2023. Again, not surprised by this. Um, so the figure here shows home investor shares for 2023 by state. California at 35%. Jeez. That was not surprising to me. Um, but here's what's surprising. Georgia? Georgia was number two. Then New Mexico. I was like, I never thought New Mexico would be on this list at all. Kansas and then Texas and Nevada I, and it, Arizona. I've been hearing a lot of people wanted to go to Kansas. 
What? Yeah, I had probably like in the last two weeks had like multiple. Are you for people. real right I now? I promise. I had. I have, when's Kansas. the last time we've mentioned the state Kansas? I, I, on I, our I, show that's why ever. I circled it because I'm like, hey, finally, um, yeah, Kansas, Alabama. I was well, like, we Whoa. okay. We hear Texas. We hear Nevada. We hear Arizona. We hear Tennessee, and we hear yeah, Utah less. I don't hear about New Mexico a lot, and we don't hear about Kansas. But that's interesting. No, so in this, so if for investor share, let's go. Let's go through this. California thirty five percent. Georgia thirty four percent. New Mexico thirty three. Kansas thirty two. Texas thirty one. Nevada thirty one. Arizona thirty. Tennessee thirty. Utah thirty. Now here's what's surprising to me about these is some of these places have very low thresholds, low barrier for entry to be an owner. Yeah. So New Mexico and Kansas, and I'm going to also say Tennessee. Parts of Tennessee, yeah. There's parts where you can totally get in. I was really surprised that these numbers are over 30% in those states. I, I'm not surprised by Tennessee. I have buddies out there that literally left two years ago to just start buying literally houses in random uh, like you know, bad neighborhoods, and now they're literally crushing it. Because what? they're crushing it, and then they went and did so far and did uh, connected with the uh, government, and they get their rents paid by the government, so everything's on Section Eight. Like so Section Eight? They, yeah. What? So they went in there and bought like neighborhoods, Andy, neighborhoods, and they wow. put them all on Section Eight. I was like, dude, that's smart. But they left like two years ago to basically start. Now they're starting to see basically their profit and their earnings and stuff like that. So here's the here's the connection that's it's interesting to me though is that you know the, that rate's really high in some of those places, but here's where it's it's really low. Only Wisconsin, Louisiana, North Dakota, New Hampshire, and South Dakota had investor shares below 20%. So these are states where uh, investors own less than 20%. But I'm not surprised with that. You know why? For the same answer a minute ago, low barrier for entry. So (laughs) what's really weird to me is that in Wisconsin, Louisiana, North Dakota, New Hampshire, South Dakota, the investor share is really low. Of course, because a lot of people can qualify in those areas, at least for price of home and commensurate income and you can get in i just thought that the same was going to be true for new mexico kansas and for tennessee we uh uh we saw a property that was worth twenty thousand in uh detroit the other day and uh the projected yeah, sorry twenty thousand multi-room two stories it i was, saw a 20 year old truck on the street that was listed for twenty thousand with one hundred and fifty thousand miles but so okay. uh and the projected rents for that area i believe were like 1800 Wait, what? Yeah, it was. I watched it with Will. <laughs> it was ridiculous, but the house wait, was. That, in a, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, wait. why yeah. is it twenty thousand? I don't. Like, is it uninhabitable? So there's probably something wrong with it. But in that area, yeah, probably. In that area, <laughs> but no, no, no. Because houses there, the highest price house was sixty thousand. Oh, jeez, what? <laughs> I mean, even it, look again. I know there's a lot of information that's missing from this. Even if you were telling me, hey, yeah, 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 that yeah, place yeah. is forty grand and it rents at eighteen hundred bucks a month, you could tell me it was forty grand and fifteen hundred bucks a month. That still pencils <laughs> that still pencils out real fast. Okay, well, we're gonna have to end the show so we can go buy that place. <laughs> Anything else on this? Inve- so uh, <laughs> we're uh, actually about to close on it. <laughs> Anything left on this one, Brian, about the investor share? I, I, uh, I appreciate CoreLogic bringing all this. I mean, there's a lot of graphs. I know we've, we flashed them on the screen here for you today. but um, You know, you one, know. Of the one, one of them was the iBuyers crashing. You know, I think two years ago when Zillow and the big techs tried to get into an overpriced, buy overpriced homes, that really, you know, propped all the prices to stay artificially elevated. And I think that's still something that we're going through right yeah. now. And a lot of these iBuyers realized that they couldn't go back and basically play the game and then resell it for a profit so they got caught either selling at a loss and either still losing out on their investment but still keeping at a higher elevated price than what they sold for what it should have actually been when they bought it so if somebody was buying it at, a, at market value they're like i'll buy it at market value times a hundred thousand yeah and then that automatically makes the prices go up a hundred thousand on houses that aren't even worth that much. So yeah. that's a huge, I think a huge piece that is talked about that now they're, you know, starting to see that it didn't work out how they wanted it to. Yes. <laughs> so very, very, very critical point. Very good point. I like that you mentioned that because as you, <laughs> I also thought, oh, I forgot to mention, <laughs> I forgot to mention that, um, you know, there are now a lot of cities and municipalities and neighborhoods that are putting rules for short term rental yeah, in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is going to cause a problem in places that in this high percentage of investor ownership that were for the specific reason of short-term renting, those could potentially potentially be under duress soon. I don't know if it's going to be right now. I have started to see a couple of places where there's like pockets of a lot of vacation areas where there are a lot of listings that are going to come onto the market because the rules now state no short-term renting. 
I think that is maybe a couple of blips on the screen we're going to see. I don't know it's going to naturally saturate the entire nation and draw down prices. I just no. think we need to be aware. Just keep your eyes open is what I'm saying. I mean, once I feel, I mean, investors are driven by their margins and by their returns. So as soon as they start, you know, not seeing those returns and those margins deplete, they're going to start offloading the ones that don't make sense or yeah. they just aren't profiting. And it's, yeah. Well, because you're making an investment choice at that point. Exactly. It's, it's this unemotional part you're talking about before. It's like, hey, this ain't penciling out. I'll take this loss, take this money, park it elsewhere. Math. I'd rather do that. Math and ain't math, math I'm, I'm out of this. Yeah. I mean, look, we have a mutual friend who like they're like they own a lot of different deals. I'm like, yeah, this one deal is um not working out. So I'm just gonna take the loss because the rest of my gain nets it out like <laughs> substantially. It so it doesn't matter. I just I'm just gonna cut off the things that that's that's losing me money. I'm, I'm over <laughs> here like uh yeah I just gotta read you a budget for the next couple of Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Brian. I appreciate yeah, you being prepared. Great comments today. Um, I like this this week's topics. You know, we're still waiting for a little bit for all you watching about the whole NAR issue and VA buyers and what's going to happen with that and the commission thing. We're still obviously waiting for information to come out. July 1st is right around the corner, but every week we're hoping that there's something new we can be sharing with you about that. Until then, Brian, I really enjoyed today's topics. Thank you for being prepared. Yeah, of course. Um, what was your favorite part of the show today? My favorite part of the show today, honestly, honestly, I think... Uh, <laughs> The investor information, I think that brings a lot of a lot of uh, uh, insight to how people are still buying it. And I think you should take that investor mindset as a residential buyer and buy with that tenacity of like, hey, if I'm going to get into this investment, how can I leverage it to its max if right now I'm not looking at it from an emotional lens? Because mm -hmm. maybe, maybe right now you shouldn't buy your, 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 your forever home, but you could get into something that's going to you know, propel you to that next house. And I think investors are a great, great uh, example of, you know, being able to profit in dark times, being able to still move forward if and when all the numbers make sense. Yeah, great point. Uh, my favorite part of the show today was the refinance signs. Um, I mean, look, I understand on the mortgage side, refinancing is effectively dead, but it's not. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why it's not, because for us, we are fielding a lot of phone calls and emails from people who are in significant yes. debt load situations. And their house is their get out of jail free card. And it's not get out of jail free, but no. it's literally my out of pocket expenses in totality over here are way higher than they are over here by absorbing all my debt and refinancing, even at this crazy market rate, right? crazy comparatively. 100%. So, um, I know that the talk on the street is, oh, refinancing is effectively dead. Well, yeah, comparatively, but it's not because we actually see here people in San Diego who are basically saving their ass money. They're saving their ass monthly <laughs> by saving money through refinancing and getting rid of their consumer debt. So if the house has to do some heavy lifting and your choice is uh, keep the house and use the house to leverage your position versus lose the house in order to pay off your debt some other way, uh, I think the house is still going to do uh, great uh, great things for people who are in the market already. So, 100%. Brian, thank you so much for joining me again today on the show. And thank you all for watching the weekly Mortgage Shows weekly podcast. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel. And also, if you have not yet checked out our new playlist, Friends of Mortgage Heroes, you can join myself, Brian, and Will. And we talk to our friends in and around real estate about success, about failures that lead to success, and things you can learn to grow more about how to make the most out of mortgage and real estate in your life as well. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you again next week. Bye.